Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second event in our new series, Your Path to Farm Transition. My name is Andrea DeGroote, and I'm a business advisor with FCC, and I'll be one of your presenters today. So today is the second of a nine part series that we've created for you, your family and, and farm management team to help you walk you through this farm transition process. These events are being held monthly and each of these meetings will be following a step by step process to help create your plan. We will be joined by other FCC business advisors, some other experts and farmers just like you. So let's get started. I am joined today by Corey Henderson, a business advisor with FCC. Welcome, Corey. Welcome, everybody. Um, coming to you from uh, down in the windy, windy southwest corner of Saskatchewan and Speedy Creek, uh, where, where life makes sense. Um, we've been, uh, just to give you guys kind of an idea what's going on here, it's, uh, it's been kind of hot and dry the last couple, uh, couple weeks. And um, got lots of grains and oil seeds operations and beef operations. So guys have been busy haying. Uh, you know, they're into now cutting some green feed and uh, actually as of last week, there was some combines starting to roll with uh, cutting some some pulses there uh, to get uh, harvest underway. So a little, little different than, than the East probably right now, I guess. But Yeah, I really like your term of Speedy Creek. I haven't heard that one yet. Um, I'm coming to you today from Stratford, Ontario. And uh, so I'm in Southern Ontario and we have actually been having a pretty dry summer. And in the last about week and a half, we've had some um, rain come through. And I know that uh, myself as a farmer and all my neighbors, we're pretty happy to see that. Um, we are most of the way through wheat. Um, obviously it depends on which part of the province you're in right at the end, right in the South, they, they're probably already done that, but uh, there's lots of my neighbors who are still working through their wheat harvest. And um, being that there's a lot of um, intensive livestock and a lot of dairy operations in my area, there is a lot of hang going on at any given time. So um, we are representing the East and the West today. And so one thing to note um, is that uh, Corey calls them grain and oil seeds. I call them cash croppers. I'm going to try to use the correct term, but we will be interchanging some of those East and West terms as we go throughout the presentation today. But Thank you for joining us, and Corey, I'm going to hand it back over to you. Yeah, so today we're going to be uh, we're going to be talking about a variety of topics, but the majority of what uh, or the idea behind a lot of what we're looking at today is really just looking at the current state of your operation. Um, now you might look at that and say, well, you know, if we're talking about transition or or preparing for transition, you know, why are we looking at the current state? Because isn't that going to change? Um, and really, what we're looking at here is is like transition is a journey. So similar to if you're trying to find. Uh, you know, or if I'm trying to find my way out to a, to a farmer's uh, home quarter, for example, um, you know, I'm going to call for those directions, similar to that you, you might be looking for a little bit of guidance on your transition journey. And, and the first thing that the, that the farmer is going to ask me when I ask for directions out to his place is he's going to say, where are you coming from? Or where are you right now? Because those directions only really mean anything if you know kind of where you're starting. Well, the same thing goes for transition. If, you're, if you need to know where, what next steps to take and, and where to go from where you are today, you kind of got to know where you are today uh, to, to figure out what those next steps are. So that's that's uh, kind of our goal today is, is to help you determine where are you today um, in a variety of different of different areas. Um, so a few of those areas that uh, that we're, we're looking at today, uh, we're just going to give you a taste on each of these because each of these could be a presentation in itself. But we're going to start by looking at your current management on your operation today. Um, then we're going to move into some current financial ratios. Uh, some of the more important ones that we're um, that we like to focus on, and then we're going to move into looking at some operational efficiencies, and, and then we're going to going to wrap it all up talking about some cash flow management. So with that, I'm going to uh, we're going to launch our first uh, polling question to give you guys an opportunity to to participate and to allow you guys to to give us a bit of information about uh, what you'd like to hear from us today. Excellent. So, Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, no worries. I was just, uh, I was going to say out of these, these four areas, like I said before, they know they can be a presentation in themselves. So um, what are, what are some of the topics here that, uh, that, uh, you know, you see as, as the most important right now, Andrea? You know what, I think a lot of people can look at these four different categories and see that they're really interconnected. And what we've tried to do is, is to separate them out and take 
one topic at a time and really dive deep into each of these because they overarchingly all do connect. Um, but in order to talk about them in, in great detail, we're going to need to take one item, item at a time. And I would say that with agriculture getting a lot more complicated, um, we need to, to slow things down and to, to really break these items out to have a more detailed conversation because a generation ago, the, the transition plans were, were not nearly as complicated. And the situations that we're dealing with right now, really you need to understand the numbers and then you also need to understand the story about what's going on within that operation. And that's why we're gonna start with management today. But um, I think overall, all four of these, um, all four of these topics are incredibly important. Yeah, I think you touched on something there, like, you know, how things have changed over time. So we, I mean, as we all know, the, the values are a lot different today than what they were in the past, but also the structures are a lot more complicated and uh, potentially, you know, more people involved than there was in the past and uh, just, just a little bit more complex. So um, it's not necessarily something to be afraid of, but uh, definitely something that we have to continue to, to you know, address and, and look at and be aware of, right? So, so we're just, uh, should be, the poll should be finishing up here anytime, I think anyways. So, okay. So the four other four areas, it looks like uh, we got a fairly even spread. So we got 30% uh, of the respondents uh, said management is the number one concern. 32% uh, said financial, 24% said operational efficiencies and 13% said cash flow. So I guess the good news is we are going to touch on all four, four uh, subjects and it is nice that uh, looks like we got a fairly even spread, uh, you know, as far as interest is, is concerned as well, right? So uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Andrew, and you're going to get us started with some management analysis. So. Excellent. Thanks, Corey. So right now on the slide, you can see that there's four different questions that are being asked. And when I sit down with people and we start talking about um, transition planning, these are four questions that I always start with. And on the surface level, they all seem rather simple. They're very easy questions. But as you start to dig deeper into them, there's actually a lot of com complex issues that come from these questions. And so we're going to impact each of these questions one at a time. Let's start with the first one of who is doing what. And this means more than the physical labor on, on the farm. This also means the bookkeeping, it means the human resources, so who's taking care of the, um, the employees, who's doing the negotiations, or does it matter on what kind of negotiation is actually happening? If it's something like purchasing a piece of equipment, that's one kind of person. Whether it's booking or selling crops, maybe that's another uh, person, but who is doing the negotiations? take some time to actually think through who are doing each of these tasks because in often in so many cases it's getting done but not necessarily everybody at the table knows who's doing which task. And the next um, question that comes from who's doing what is how is the work divided? Especially when we have mixed enterprises or there's, there's more than one commodity um, within a farm, how is that work being divided out? Is it by commodity? Is it by task? Or is it all hands on deck? So if it's a special time of year, then everybody is going to be um, joining in and really working through all of that work. Let's take some time to recognize the people at the table and for all of the hard work that they do. Taking some time out of this process and really doing it at the beginning to acknowledge what tasks are being um, done by each of the uh, partners is a really important part important part of this whole process because you're going to acknowledge who is involved in this operation and their value that they're bringing to the table. The next question is who is leading or who's deciding what? Before we get to the financials, it's important to recognize that these financial results are a direct connection from the people who are making these decisions. And so what is that decision making process? Who is making the decisions? Is it a group? Is it a consensus? Um, does everybody know what the decision making process is for major and minor details within the, the farming operation? This is often where people get tense because they don't know that process or it changes and they don't know when it changes. So recognizing and clarifying what that decision making process is really important. And in the last session, Joel and Anessa um, went into some detail to describe the importance of that asset ownership. So taking the time to know 
who owns what asset and in what structure it's actually held. Is it in the corporation? Is it personally held? Is it a part of a partnership? Who owns those assets? And does everyone at the table, again, have that same um, amount of information about who owns those assets? Who needs what? We're gonna start by doing this at, and asking this question at the beginning. So when I think of who needs what, one of the core questions that we're gonna come up with is that senior generation. What does retirement need? What does retirement mean? Do they wanna still be involved? Do they wanna reduce? Do they wanna split some of the time? What kind of financial um, settlement or financial needs are they gonna have in their retirement? That's one element of it. For that junior generation, understanding these expectations and these needs is really important. So it's a matter of um, what expectations do they have coming in? What kind of financial obligations are they making or are they going to need? These are important questions to ask at the beginning because then we know where people are starting at. They will change over time, but again, taking some time to really start and write all of these questions out and write how this is imp getting impacted in your business right now, this is a really important part of um, starting this financial conversation. Corey, do you have some examples of how we can see this working in real life pharma uh, situation? Yeah, I think, um, you know, to kind of illustrate, I think why this, why this management analysis is so important, you know, I can, you can kind of look at two different extremes. So you can have, you know, one extreme where, you know, maybe that, uh, that younger producer is, is either, you know, not involved today, but looking to get involved or, or is um, maybe involved in more in like a hired hand capacity where they're, they're providing labor, but maybe not as, as involved in any of the management decisions. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum is a scenario where there's maybe that junior generation is, is running a, a separate operation of them their own where they're sharing maybe labor and some equipment, but they have, they maybe already own a bit of farmland or rent some of their own farmland. Um, they're, they've already got a relationship with an accountant. They've got a relationship with a financial institution. They're making some of their own marketing decisions, things like that. They're really, they're doing a lot of the same management tasks as their parents, but just doing it maybe on a, on a smaller scale. So in those two different scenarios, you can see how the how the learning curve is a, is a lot steeper for the first example than it is for the second example. And the confidence is also uh, far greater in the second example than the first, because that, that producer is already, you know, they kind of know what, what they need to do. Uh, they've been practicing it. They've probably made a few mistakes along the way, which is a good thing, and, and learn from them, hopefully on a smaller scale. Um, whereas that, that first example, like they got a lot to learn and it's gonna take some time and, it, and it's gonna take time for that confidence, uh, both for that junior generation and for the, the senior generation in that case as well. So I think that's, a, that's a, a good illustration, in my opinion anyways, of why that management analysis is so important for, for us to look at when we're looking at this current state. Um, so with, with more people involved, uh, I think then, uh, you know, we gotta look at how decisions are made. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Andrea, for the next polling question. Thanks, Corey. So the next question is, how are decisions made on your farm? Is it a single pe person making all of the decisions? Is it a consensus of the group, so everybody who's at the table, or does it depend on the decision being made? I'm curious to see what the what the breakdown of this uh, vote will be. Corey, what do you see in most of the operations that you you work with? Well, I guess the question is: is what do I? Um, what do people say? How do they? How do they say that they that they make uh, decisions, or how do they actually make decisions? Because I guess what uh, what I find in a lot of our scenarios is, um, you know, maybe they say, well, we make the decisions by consensus, because that's that's always the dream, I think, is to make those decisions by consensus. But when push comes to shove and there's a disagreement, then how is the decision made? Because I think that's a true tale of, uh, of really how decisions are made. Um, it's really easy to make decisions when everybody is arriving at the same conclusion, but it's when you're going two different directions that you got to say, well, okay, what do we do then? Do we have a process? Does somebody kind of have the ultimate decision? In which case, then it is maybe a little more of the single person deciding. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say in a lot of cases, my or my experience, we're seeing consent. People say consensus, but is it really a consensus in the end? I can't, I can't agree more because I I often ask this question when we're at the kitchen table with families, and they will say consensus, and then you start to ask the question, and it says. And it seems to feel that one person really truly believes that this is a consensus. While 
the reality is it depends on the decision that's being made. So if it's a larger decision, I would say that it really truly that's going to be pulling in more information while when we're having maybe an equipment or a smaller scale decision that's going to be that person who's most involved or or maybe it's a time um, decision where it, something needs to be decided in a really short order but what about the polling results what do you see well it looks to me like uh 20 of our of our group is is um saying that, that the decisions are made by one single person uh, 10% is, uh, is saying that they make the decisions by consensus and 70% uh, say it depends on the decision being made. So I think like based on your comments about, uh, you know, in your operation, I think that's pretty accurate and that's actually a pretty good sign um, because I do agree that, it, that not every decision necessarily has to be made by everybody. Um, and really, you know, the, the uh, I guess the key there is, is those decisions that are made by consensus, how are we arriving at that, right? So, um, exactly. So with that, we're going to turn our, we're going to go on to some tools you can use, I guess, to kind of help yourself make decisions. And one of those tools is financial ratios. So, you know, what is a ratio? Um, basically, a ratio is just a, a way of comparing, you know, a certain financial aspect on your on your operation or some some data on your operation to another financial aspect. And, and the value of a ratio is is that it it adds a little bit more substance to a number. Um, and it allows you to compare your operation to say other operations in the industry or other, you know, maybe neighbors, that type of thing. Even if you maybe are a little different structure or a little different size, that type of thing, because um, it kind of allows it kind of level sets, I guess, amongst these different operations. So um, now there's, there's countless ratios that are out there. You can pretty much, um, you know, there's a lot that exists and there's ones you can even come up with your own ratios if you really want uh, to measure every aspect of your operation. So what we're going to focus on today is three key ratios that we see as, as very important for, for um, any farming operation, as well as they're used pretty universally across business and across the, the different industries that we deal in. Um, the first of, of which ratio, uh, in my opinion, is one of the more important ratios, um, which is the current ratio. Um, this also, we like to complicate things. We use lots of different terms, of course. So we, uh, another, another term for the current ratio is the, the liquidity ratio uh, or working capital. So if somebody says, you know, what's your working capital look like or what's your liquidity like, really they're all referring back to this current ratio. So how do we calculate current ratio? So the, the, the formula of it is fairly simple. It's basically current assets divided by current liabilities. Um, current assets are any assets that are either cash or expected to be converted to cash in the next 12 months, um, while current liabilities are either, are basically things that are payable within 12 months as well. So current assets is cash, uh, accounts receivable, uh, inventory, or potentially market livestock. Well, current liabilities would be things like balances on your lines of credit, your accounts payable for the year, um, your, and then as well, your, your current portion of long-term debt, which is basically the payments you have due for that, for that particular year. Now, we all, we all want more inventory and more cash than we want than payables. So the higher that ratio is, the better, the stronger it is. And anything greater than one basically means that you have uh, sufficient cash and inventory to meet the payables and, and things you gotta pay for for that particular year. Anything less than one, shows that there may be a shortfall in the amount of inventory or cash to meet those, those commitments for the next 12 months. And that may be a concern depending on your industry and depending on, uh, I guess, what the story is behind it, um, which is also, I think, a key um, thing to realize, I guess, with ratios is that really the story is almost as important as the ratio itself. So if you find that you know ratio that maybe you're higher or lower than a benchmark, uh, don't despair, You know, look at it try to figure out why is that ratio different than maybe the, the rest of the industry. And then if, if it is a concern, then how do we, how do we change it, right? Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrew and she's gonna give us a little bit of an example with, uh, with that current ratio and how an interest rate, uh, interest rate fluctuations can really impact that number. Thanks, Corey. So in terms of when you're looking at these ratios, 
the concepts can kind of feel foreign until you actually have the ability to, to take a real life scenario and work through it. And so what I'm going to do today is talk through, unfortunately, a very real situation for, for everyone today. And that's the increases in the interest rate that we have seen from the Bank of Canada since the beginning of the year. So the Bank of Canada, which is the overnight rate, has increased by 1.75% since the beginning of the year. So when we're thinking specifically about the current ratio and we're talking about liquidity, that means the cash in and cash out that you have in your operation, how does an interest rate increase like that 1.75% increase that we've seen so far this year, how does that actually translate and what aspects of your current ratio would be impacted by that? So as Corey just highlighted, your assets, that's going to be relatively independent of that but we're going to be talking about the current liabilities. And so in the current liabilities, and especially when you think of interest rates, a lot of people tend to go to long-term debt. So whether you have that um, long-term mortgage payment or any of those kinds of um, situations, that's what they think of when they think of interest rate increases. How is it gonna impact that debt? And that comes back in and is actually calculated in the current ratio through the current portion of your long-term debt. So that's the debt payments in the next 12 months. That's going to take into account your principal payments as well as your interest costs. So if you have a uh, if you have some of these um, debts already put into fixed rate costs, there's not going to be a change in those interest rate costs because you're going to know your blended payments. However, if some of your longer term debt is actually on variable rates, this is where you're going to see that current portion of long term debt go up because your interest costs are going to be increasing over the next 12 months. And so that current portion of long term debt is going to be going up as that impact of that interest rate is, is felt. Your payables is another part in your current liabilities where you're going to see some potential for impact from that interest rate increase. And so taking a look at if you're having to carry payables, what is the, the interest charge that's being charged on those? And is that increasing with this interest rate increase? The last is the most significant, and that's your line of credit or revolving credit. I'm gonna take a couple of minutes to actually talk through the impact of this um, interest rate increase on the line of credit specifically. So one is we're gonna use some actual numbers because it's easier to actually follow through when we're talking with, with financial numbers. So I'm gonna use an example of a million dollars. So. This line of credit or revolving credit line is for $1 million. And last year, I'm going to use the example that it was the interest rate on that uh, $1 million line of credit was about 4%. This year, it's 5.75% because we've had that 1.75% increase year over year. So your actual cash costs are, have increased about 39, 40% year over year. So that means that your revolving credit line, even if you've done it differently, is going to be taking more, your interest costs on that are going to be actually increasing year over year. And the reason I'm bringing up the line of credit specifically is because a lot of people don't necessarily pay attention when the interest payments are coming out connected to their line of credit. It comes in and it goes out and it's all connected to that line of credit. But this is something that as it goes up, as your interest rates go up and you can't fix you can't uh, put your line of credit or revolving credit line, you can't put a fixed rate on it. So it's completely exposed to whatever the Bank of Canada does. It's gonna go up and it's gonna go down. And again, the reason I'm spending a little bit more time on here is maybe not everybody in your operation understands how your revolving credit works. This is a time to use this as an example to talk through, especially with that next generation, how revolving credit lines actually work. Because the year over year is going to increase. Um, in, in this example, it's about a 40% increase in actual costs, but that's all going to be connected back to that current liability. And that's going to be depleting or reducing that current ratio, meaning it's taking more cash to service the debt that we have right now in our current liabilities. So that's one example of where interest rates and current light and your current ratio are actually interconnected. So Corey, I'm going to hand it back over to you. For sure. So I, I think that's a really good, uh, really good scenario you're using, Andrew, and, and uh, really reflects how, how much that interest rate fluctuation can really impact that current ratio. Um, the other thing that can really impact your current ratio that, um, that I know I see, I guess, depending on the industry, 
is uh, is timing. So being that that your current ratio is made up of your inventory and your and your balances and such on your lines of credit, you know it can fluctuate daily. Um, so you know what what is the best time to measure that ratio, or what's the you know what time do we you know how do we manage that? I guess so. I think the key there is to be consistent, especially if we're if we're measuring it at periodic times throughout the year and and you know comparing it to the past. Um, but quite likely, it's it's probably best to do that uh, that measurement kind of at the end of production cycle, because it's a little bit of a cleaner time, um, because the you know the crop is hopefully in the bin or or in the case of a livestock producer that you know the calves are have either just been sold or are ready to be sold and you know kind of what prices are at that type of thing. Um, so I'm going to illustrate a bit of an example of how that can change. Uh, so if you've got a cow-calf producer, for example, um, and you take that measurement in the fall, when once again you've sold your calves, you likely got a lot of cash on hand or, or some cash on hand or the line of credit's been cleared off, that type of thing. Um, and and you've you got your feed stock, you know, the, the, hopefully you're, you're, um, there's a plentiful amount of feed on hand uh, at the end of that, uh, that haying season. Um, and yet, yet you don't probably have quite as much payables at that point either. Whereas if you take that same livestock producer and you measure those same items in March or April, um, you know, it can be drastically different because that feed, that feed supply has probably been, uh, you know, a lot of that is, has been used over the course of the winter. And yet the, the calves aren't maybe, or maybe just being born or, or haven't been born yet. So you don't have that inventory number either. Um, so that same operation, same type of assets just throughout that production cycle, that can vary drastically based on, uh, just that, you know, a course of a few months, right? Um, so what I'll, I'm going to move on to is our next ratio, which is the debt to equity ratio. Um, now, once again, we like to use lots of different terms for this. So another term for the debt to equity ratio is our, is the leverage ratio. Um, once again, why do we care about, about the debt to equity or the leverage ratio and, and how do we calculate it? So your debt to equity ratio is, uh, is calculated by taking your overall debt on the operation divided by the equity. So your equity is your debt or your total assets minus your debt uh, for your overall net worth number. Um, we do want, uh, we tend to want uh, less debt. I, I say this as, as producers, I guess, and as, as a financial institution, usually less debt uh, relative to the amount of assets is, is probably better. Um, so the, the, uh, the lower your debt relative to your net worth, the stronger that ratio is. Um, if that ratio is, is one, or uh, basically that means you have the same amount of debt as you have equity. If it's below one, then you have more equity than, than debt and vice versa. If it's above one, you have more, more debt than you have equity. So um, why do we care? Uh, basically, if you have, if you're a younger producer, and, and you've been expanding, maybe starting your operation, you, don't, you haven't had that chance to build up the equity, you've probably been taking on some new purchases, maybe you're taking over an existing operation, you're likely gonna have a little higher debt to equity. Uh, and that's okay, as long as the cash flow is there to, to meet all the commitments. Uh, whereas if you're more of a mature operation, I would expect that debt to equity number to be a lot, uh, you know, a lot lower because there's chances that you've bought a lot of assets a number of years ago that have have appreciated maybe over time, or you've paid down debt over time, if you've had that time to build that equity. Um, so those numbers can vary drastically and they're both you know, potentially acceptable as long as the cash flow is there. Um, the key I'd say if, if it's more the, uh, the senior generation situation um, is that if the debt to equity is lower, it does provide some opportunities for the next, uh, for that transition that there's maybe a little bit of room to, uh, to support the next generation coming in. Uh, or even weather some storms as far as if there's uh, any sort of financial difficulty or that type of thing um, that you can can leverage some of that that equity to kind of help you through some of those difficult times. Um, now I would uh, I would mention you know the numbers when we're using we're talking about the you know your total equity. Um, now that that total equity number depends on the on the type of uh, values you're using, and by type of values I mean cost versus market. So. Your cost is basically what you've paid for an asset minus whatever depreciation uh, has accrued over time, uh, whereas market is whatever it would sell for today. Um, now those two values, depending on when an asset was bought and, and what the markets, uh, what land markets and such have done, uh, can, can vary quite drastically. And, and they can make the debt to equity ratio vary drastically as well. So I can't tell you what, what values to use or which is better, um, but I guess my advice to you would be is just to be consistent. 
uh, and then to understand the impact on the ratio based on the value that you're using. So to illustrate this, you know, you might have an operation that, um, you know, maybe purchased a, a quarter section of land or a farm uh, for $50,000, say in the past, and today it's worth a half a million dollars. Well, it's the same asset one way or the other, but the, the difference in the values is it differs by a, by a factor of 10. So you can, you can appreciate that that ratio will also vary quite substantially based on what you use. So if you find that, you know, your, your, maybe your debt to equity is a bit high relative to the benchmark, but you're using cost, well, maybe that's, that's okay. Um, whereas if you're using market values and you find that, you're, that your debt to equity is, is maybe a bit high, well, maybe it is something more to look into. So once again, it's the story behind these numbers is as important as the number as well and saying, you know, is this something we need to be concerned about or is this acceptable given our current situation? Um, so our last, our last ratio that I'm going to look at right now is the return on investment or return on assets. Um, the way that we, that we calculate your return on investment or return on assets is we basically take your net income from your financial statement and we divide it by the total assets. Um, once again, you might ask, well, why is this important? Um, to me, the importance here uh, when I look at, uh, at a lot of operations is, is that you know, agriculture is a, is a capital hungry business. You need a lot of assets to generate revenue. Um, and this just gives you an opportunity to be able to look on your operation, how efficiently are we using the assets we have? And, or maybe are there any opportunities to generate more revenue with the same assets or uh, are there other assets that can be leveraged to, to kind of add that, that revenue? So once again, with the return on investment or return on assets, similar to the debt to equity, it does depend on what values you're using. So cost versus market. So just uh, be aware that whichever you're gonna use, be consistent and, and then be aware on how that would change the ratio um, you know, for the, the better or worse, I guess, depending on those values. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea, and she's going to show you guys how you can use some tools that are on our FCC website to calculate these ratios for yourself. Thanks, Corey. Now, I do understand that some people at home don't quite enjoy doing the math and doing the calculation quite as much as Corey and I. And so, Corey went through a lot of the details of what these financial ratios are and how you're going to use them, what they mean, why we want to care. And with all of that good information, now we need to talk through how can we actually do this and how can we put and do some math at home. And so what you're going to see is actually on, um, on the slide here, you're seeing a screenshot of a farm financial ratio calculators that we have on our external website. So what I mean by that is you go to fcc.ca and it's going to pull up. You're going to go into knowledge and you're going to go into financial and or you can even do it by search and do farm financial ratios. There will also be a link that's going to be shared with you at the um, at the end in the follow up email and it's going to take you to this page. And we have three different calculators here. We have liquidity, which is our current ratio. We have solvency, which is our debt to equity. And then we also have um profitability, which is that return on investments or return on assets that Corey just spoke through. So how do we get these numbers to input into this calculator now? And oftentimes we see that when you get your account prepared statement, so at the end of the year, you have all of this information and you're either your banker or your accountant will sit down and will have these like have these ratios already calculated for you. But what do you do during the year? How do you get the information to make sure that you can go and actually figure out your current ratio during the year, just as Corey was talking about that, that cash flow cycle. And so what I'm gonna talk through is a bit of the step-by-step -step process on how you can calculate some of these financials using these calculators during the year. So if you're going to be going and using your internal bookkeeping systems, and I'm gonna uh, use an example like Ag Expert. What you're going to need to do is once you've updated, maybe even on a quarterly basis, you're going to, um, you have all your income and your expenses for that quarter in there, then you're going to want to run a balance sheet. And in that balance sheet, you're going to have your current assets and your current liabilities. Now, basics is you're going to take those two numbers and you're going to input it into this calculator and that's going to give you the number. And it's also going to give you some ratios of maybe where you want to hit in terms of a benchmark. However, we're going to take a moment because Corey was just talking about the importance of using consistent numbers. So 
before you input those numbers straight from your um, ag expert or from your internal bookkeeping, take a look at them. Are they realistic numbers? When you're looking at your inventory, is this carryover from your last year end and you maybe haven't updated your inventory? Because not everybody always keeps their internal bookkeeping for their inventory numbers right up to date. So take a look, take a look at the value that you have there. And is that a realistic um, reflection of what's going on in your farm right now? And I would also encourage you, if you're going to be using these ratios during the year, write down what you included. So is it per corporation or is it your entire business, maybe some corporate farms and some personal as well? What's being included? What's being recorded in these numbers? That's important so that as you're moving forward, you can come back and you compare. And when you have that information, you're comparing apples to apples because this information, this is for you. We're not, we're not calculating these numbers for the banker or for anyone else. This is for your own management. And again, back to Corey's point of the numbers are important, but the story is more important. When you understand what's going into these numbers, that's when you can take the time to have the conversation with your next generation or even your farm managers. And that's when we're going to see the increase in the financial literacy. You're going to understand the story and the why of what's going on to change these numbers. So I would encourage you at the end to even click on the link that's going to be included in this email. And that's going to take you to this page and start working with the numbers and understand how an increase in your liabilities is going to impact your court ratio or how the changes in your inventory change that overall current ratio. And when you're actually using these numbers, that's going to give you an increased confidence in why you're going to be actually working through and uh, relying on some of this financial ratios to be a part of your normal day-to-day -day decision making process. Corey? Uh, so yeah, I'm, now that we've, uh, we, we can definitely appreciate that uh, not everybody gets quite as excited about uh, about talking about ratios as we do in the end. Uh, but we are curious to ask the audience, you know, how many of you uh, are actually utilizing your financial ratios? Um, and then I'd be curious as well to find out, you know, who, um, you know, is it is it one specific person on the operation that's looking at this or is this more of a group discussion in the end? So if you want to go to the poll um, and answer, um, we'd really appreciate that and we can, can see what the group consensus is. So what I, I know, like for myself, when we're talking about ratios, um, you know, we, we're, we're joking about being about being as excited as we are, I guess, about it. Um, but really what, I, what interests me is really how these ratios all work together. And, and then to kind of see that potential or that, um, you know, in a lot of cases, even when I talk to a client about, a, you know, here's, here's something that I see on your operation, like it looks like maybe your liquidity ratio is a little bit tight. Um, they're like, yeah, you know, totally. It, it seems like we're always you know, living hand to mouth, that type of thing. Um, so it's funny how when you bring up the ratio, they kind of know it, but they don't necessarily, uh, you know, see the ratio itself or, or really have, they haven't really calculated it themselves. So um, hopefully this, this kind of helps, I guess, uh, everybody put some, some, you know, knowledge, I guess, about what these ratios mean. Absolutely. And I, I do tend to see that if we can use a common language, that definitely helps. So when we're talking about liquidity or working capital, we understand when we say current ratio, we know what how that math is done. And so then we can understand how the changes are actually going to impact that, that change in the math or that change in the ratio. And I find that people will be using the ratios at year end or when maybe they're going to be making a larger purchase they lean on their banking or their accountant for those larger ratios but it's not something that they use day to day in their every uh, in their everyday kind of decision making process it tends to be driven by bigger events like that year end or large expansion and and when we can get used to and incorporate these kinds of um, decisions it's really important um, and it increases that financial literacy, which is ultimately what we're trying to do here. So based on the, on the feedback from the crowd, we got 18% uh, that are saying, yes, you are using, utilizing your financial ratios today. 52% uh, that are saying not really. And 29% that say it depends on the de decision being made. 
So, I mean, basically, I guess we've got about a 50-50 split between, you know, I guess, producers that are out there that are using uh, using these ratios, uh, maybe not all the time, but at least in some capacity, and then about 50% that, uh, that aren't using them at all. So our goal today is not necessarily to make you as excited about ratios as us, uh, nor is it uh, to make you guys experts in ratios, but I think just appreciate where they can fit and really where they can be useful in your operation. So hopefully the 52% that say not really, um, you know, we'd love to, to, to see you um, maybe be a little more interested in it if, if possible and, uh, and empower you with that information to find out why uh, or how to use them, I guess, right? So, um, so we're gonna move on to talking about uh, operational efficiencies. Um, so once again, there's a, I'm gonna touch on a, a ratio that we use when we're talking about operational efficiencies because we love our ratios. Um, so that particular uh, ratio that we're going to discuss is the operating expense ratio. Now, the, the way that you calculate your operational expense ratio is you take your variable expenses or your operating expenses, which are, are basically any expenses that are kind of directly rela uh, related to the production of, of, you know, whatever commodity you're producing. And they tend to vary with, you know, the size of your operation. Um, you know, from year to year and they don't, so they don't usually include any overhead items. So they don't usually include like land rent or um, payments for the year or depreciation or those type of things. Um, but they do include things like your inputs, like your fertilizer, your chemical, maybe the wages for, for a hired hand, um, fuel repairs, that type of thing, I guess, right? So you calculate operating expense ratio, you take your total operating expenses or to total variable expenses and you divide it by your gross revenue. So to give you an idea of, of kind of where different industries stack up, uh, I guess as far as an average is concerned, a, a grains and oil seeds operation, um, you know, on average, it'd be probably somewhere around 65% operating expense ratio. Uh, dairy would be, you know, 65 to 70%, and say a feedlot would be a, quite a bit higher at about 95%. So for a grains and oil seeds operation, for example, at 65%, what that means is, is for every dollar that that operation is generating of gross revenue, they're spending about 65 cents in variable expenses or operating expenses, which leaves about 35 cents to cover overhead, uh, to make loan payments and to, to pay, you know, living expenses and, and that type of thing. So in our current environment with, uh, with inflation on the rise, um, that's going to get even more important because inflation tends to impact the expenses more than the more than the revenue. Um, so if if your operating expense ratio, you know, I would expect that it's there's a good chance that it's uh, it's going to get higher, I guess, as as time goes on. If that if the expenses are going to grow at a faster rate than revenue. Um, so the the um, when you're looking at your operating expense ratio, similar to what we're saying before, the story is is as important as anything. So when we're looking at, you know, a mixed operation or maybe depending on your structure, um, you know, that, that may impact your operating expense ratio as well. So if you're a mixed operation, like said feedlot and maybe a, a grain operation, I would expect that to be a little higher operating expense ratio. Um, whereas same thing as if you're like a cow-calf producer or a dairy that owns a lot of your land base and grows your own feed, I would also expect that operating expense ratio should be a little bit better than average because um, you're basically growing your own feed and not having to buy that feed. Um, now that operating expense ratio has to be a little bit better in that situation because you're also likely making a little bit more loan payments than what another operation would have that's buying that feed, right? So it's, um, once again, it's the story behind it and, uh, and uh, that's what's important. Um, so the final uh, ratio that I'm going to talk to as far as the operational efficiencies is just looking at your profit drivers. So like I said before, there's a lot of mixed operations out there. There's also a lot of uh, a lot of operations that got a lot of irons in the fire, and oftentimes we don't actually look at you know what what aspects of our operation are the most profitable uh, or the most efficient per se. Um, you know, it's just overall our operation is making X amount of dollars. So what what I mean by profit drivers is is really looking at okay this aspect of my operation um, you know is generating this return on on assets or return on investment. So back to that ratio that we said before. Um, whereas this, this area of our operation is, is maybe generating uh, higher or lower depending and, and we might, that may help us make that decision on maybe where we focus our efforts uh, or where we, sp where we spend more time or where we expand depending on opportunity. So that profit drivers is very important if you're, if you're looking at you know, how can we be more profitable going forward or where can we expand to, to add more cash flow. 
Um, so we did talk a little bit about benchmarks. And I understand a lot of these benchmarks we're talking about are, are very countrywide or very, you know, large regions. So one of the things we've worked on with Farm Credit is, is actually coming up with a tool that uh, can add a little bit more value to producers and, and have a little bit more specific benchmarks as far as their local area and their local uh, operations. So for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea to give us a bit of an explanation of how that tool works. Great, thanks, Corey. So this is a new initiative for FCC, and right now this is available for dairy and for grains and oil seeds. And so let's talk a bit about how this actually works. And so understanding your 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 current operation is a really essential to know how how and if you can change your operation and what options you have going forward. So let's talk about how you're gonna get access to this report. There's an example of the report on here, and um, this is open to FCC and non-FCC um, uh, farmers. So what you would do is if you have a relationship manager, reach out to them. And if you're not an FCC mem um, client, then you can just reach out to your local FCC office. You're going to need to prepare um, two years or provide two years of your accountant prepared statements. And this is going to provide a report of similar sized operations in your geographical area. And it's going to highlight, th there's actually different five different areas that it's going to break down. And the first one's gonna be revenue and expenses are all broken into dairy, in this example with the dairy. So there's dairy expenses that are directly connected to producing milk, your fixed expenses, which is more like your overhead uh, costs, and then your variable. And then at the end, it's actually gonna give an output of um, some actual uh, profitability. So you're gonna be talking about a few different ratios. So let's get into a little bit more detail about what's included within this benchmarker report. So when you actually pull up the report, as you can see on the screen, milk before deductions has the benchmark, which is the group average. It's then going to have your operation followed by the rank. So when you provided those two, the last two years of your accountant prepared statements, that's going to give three years and you can start to see trends. You can see trends in the industry because of that benchmark, that group average, and you can see um, trends within your own farm. And by going through and having different dairy expenses, which would be feed, vet, breeding, um, livestock purchases, any of that kind of stuff, your fixed costs are going to be larger, like your depreciation, land rent, property taxes, those kinds of fixed costs that are not determined are not necessarily determined on how much output you're going to be um, making. And then those variable costs are going to be those um, like building and uh, repair costs, your fuel costs. These are the ones that we're really going to be for this particular year, we're going to be seeing some inflationary pressures on these items. But with having a three year, you get to see the, the changes in your operation year over year and compare to what that average is. This isn't just coffee shop numbers. These are actual numbers from other people's financial statements. So there's some credible information that is being provided. The last page is your profitability page. So we're gonna talk about net income per kg. So what's after all of this expense, what's hit the net um, left over? We're gonna talk about term liabilities. So in that situation, we're gonna be talking about the your debt per kg, which is a common um, benchmark that a lot of people use. And the last part of that, um, that report is gonna have an average amortization. So that what the length, average length of um, everyone's amortization is. So this report is available and I would encourage you if you're interested and you're in the dairy or the grains and oil seeds industry to reach out to your local RM, relationship manager or your local FCC office and provide your financial statements as well as a production um, in terms of how many units of production you have and you'll be able to get, to, uh, get this report. Personally, I've been using this report as part of a knowledge gap um, assessment for the next generation. There's a lot of information in these reports and it's really nice to see where you are in your operation in comparison to other people's. And with that, we're actually gonna move on to the next slide to talk about cash flow management. So this is one of those areas that a lot of people, it, it's a, it causes a lot of stress. Cash is king is a, is a key word that we find often in agriculture. And so when we talk about cash flow management, we're going to start with a couple of different ratios and um, a different concept. Well, not really a different concept, but a concept that I find a lot of value in. And that's the cash flow budget. So taking 
maybe leaning on your last year's financials and understanding when your cash cycles come in and, and what's going on in your operation. So understanding when the money comes in and when the money comes out. This is an area that takes a lot of mental load in terms of the person. And typically that's one person that's gonna be doing a lot of this work to understand how much money you have available for the operation to meet your monthly obligations. But if you can take that back up and actually look at an annual process and say what's coming in, what's going out, and share that information with our other people, you're sharing that mental load. And this is something that's really, really important as we're talking about moving the operation forward and moving that management forward, is does everyone understand what it takes from a cash flow perspective for that money in and money out. When we talk about cash flow management, one of the most common ratios is debt service capacity. And so that usually relates directly back to the, the term lending. And what it means is it measures the operations ability to service the debt. So for every dollar of debt payments it has, how much, how much cash does it have to service that debt? And so the actual formula for this is that you take your net income from your farm and you're gonna make a couple adjustments. So you're gonna add back in taxes, uh, term interest, depreciations, maybe take out those living costs, and you're gonna divide that by the debt service or the requirements that you have on your operation. And that's gonna give you that ratio of how much uh, debt servicing you need and how much cash you have available to service that debt. So again, Knowing the numbers and knowing the math is a big part of this. Taking that back and sharing that information and understanding the rest of the story is really where we're going with this. And so I'm going to put it back over to Corey and he's going to talk about some of the different changes and some of the other ways that we can manage our cash flow management. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so one of the one common theme that I that I hear on a lot of operations when when we're talking about transition is so there's the, the, the next generation is, is quite eager to start building equity and wanting to be involved and taking over some ownership of the operation. But the senior generation may be looking at, you know, geez, we, we already kind of, um, like, you know, we don't have an abundance of cash. Um, and they're, they're really finding that, you know, there's only capacity to pay their existing um, uh, debts and, and there's not a whole lot extra for that, that next generation to come into. And what that comes down to a lot, in a lot of cases is that, that at that stage of their operation, there's a good chance that the, a lot of their debts are nearly paid off. So they probably only have a few years left on them, uh, or maybe even some of the existing debts that they have, uh, they maybe have taken a more aggressive um, amortization on to try to get them paid off faster. So oftentimes I hear the, the senior generation say, you know, I'm not going to transition anything until I have my debt fully paid because that's going to give that, that uh, capacity for the next generation to be able to, to come in and take over and it's going to give them a bit of a break. Um, so, I mean, that may be, may be a good, uh, good option in the end, but uh, I also would encourage you to look at, you know, what is your existing, your existing uh, average amortization on your debt? So if you have an operation that has a million dollars worth of debt, for example, and an average amortization of eight years, so meaning you know there's there's some some debts that are going to be longer and shorter, but average is eight years. Um, you know you you'd have at five percent interest, you'd have payments of about one hundred and fifty five thousand dollars per year. Now, if you took that same debt uh, at five percent once again, and you stretch it out over say twenty five years, which may seem extreme, but I'm trying to ar articulate I guess how much of a difference it can make. Um, you know that would drop the payments per year down to seventy one thousand. So that's a difference of $84,000 per year. Well, that $84,000 could, could free up the cash flow for potentially a, a, some sort of a payout for that senior generation if the, if the junior generation is wanting to buy a part of the operation. Uh, it also can provide some living expenses for that next generation if they're wanting to be involved. Um, but but you know, they're, you're, you're afraid of it's the capacity for, to provide their living expenses. Um, now, I will caution you on this as well, that I mean, every... Uh, Everything you're looking at, there's usually a side effect, and one of those side effects is interest cost. So stretching out to like the way that I guess that uh, the payments work on these longer term loans is you the the bulk of your of your uh, payment up front on a longer term loan is going to be interest and a lot less principal. So as interest rates increase, the the interest cost um, can can add up awfully quick. So to our, to, to show that that impact. You could take the same million dollars that we just discussed at, uh, that we said over 25 years is paid down 
The payments were $71,000 per year. Now, if the interest rate increases from 5% to 7%, that increases the payment to 85,000. Now that doesn't seem that substantial. It's, I mean, it's $14,000 regardless. Um, but when you look at actually what increase, what percentage increase in payment that is, that's a 20% increase in payment. So you can imagine over the course of that 25 years, how much extra interest that is that you're gonna be paying. So although changing the, the structure of your debt can maybe make room for that next generation, um, and it may be the right option for you, I, I would just say to exercise some caution and, uh, and really try to find what's the right mix to, to remain viable, but also to minimize that interest cost long-term. Um, the other thing I would say to you as well, when we're looking at interest rates, is that is really looking at your operation and saying, okay, how much of an interest rate increase can we afford with this transition? And, and really looking at, uh, you know, if, if you can only afford a small increase in interest rates, what are our options to mitigate that risk? You know, are, can we look at some fixed rates? Are those fixed rates affordable? Um, that type of thing. Whereas, you know, if you're in an operation where you can afford quite a substantial increase in interest rates, maybe you don't have to be quite as concerned about those risks in the end. So, um, so with that, we're gonna we're just gonna start wrapping up here right now, and we're gonna talk about how to use your financial ratio. So once again, I can appreciate not everybody here is is going to be um, as interested in ratios or as, as comfortable with ratios as, as Andrea and I are. Um, but what I would say is you have a lot of professionals around you that are that are comfortable, and you can leverage to to help you interpret the ratios on your operation. Um, one of those professionals that I would encourage you to reach out to is your accountant. Uh, the other professional I'd encourage you to, to reach out to is your FCC relationship manager. Um, if you provide your FCC relationship manager with up-to-date financials each year, um, you know, for different lending needs that you're looking at, um, you know, they already have a lot of that information inputted that they can be able, that they can, can look at and they can give you some feedback on what they're seeing and what, you know, what are the, what are the ratios on your operation given that financial statement um, and, and maybe even give you a third-party opinion on you know, where are some opportunities they see or maybe where are some concerns? So I would really encourage you to reach out to both those professionals if you're not uh, as comfortable maybe with calculating the ratios yourself uh, or interpreting them yourself. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do is to set some time aside to talk with your family about where you're at with, your, with the financials on your ratio and or with the financials on your operation and where your ratios are at today. Oftentimes there's somebody in the operation that, that is you know, comfortable with calculating these ratios and, and uh, is comfortable with interpreting them, but are they sharing them? So a regular meeting, uh, whether it be depending on your operation, the size, complexity, who's all involved, uh, maybe that's an annual meeting, maybe it's as, as frequent as, a, as a, you know, a monthly or even a, a weekly meeting if you're a larger operation with lots of people involved and, and lots of moving parts. Um, but basically you'd wanna calculate those ratios in advance, send them out to everybody who's gonna be present for the meeting, give them a chance to look at them and review them. Um, and then, you know, sit down and meet and say, you know, where, where does everybody see, does anybody have any concerns? Where, and really share kind of where everybody's at. So, um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Andrea and she's gonna wrap us up today. Thanks, Corey. So we often find that transition planning really does get kind of stuck or focused in on the financial challenges of the operation. And so one of our goals today was to highlight some of the ratios that you can use to really bring the conversation and bring everyone who's at the table using a common language and also to have another group of people that you can um, understand how to get this information and really how to move it forward. So we also need people at the table and understanding where the, the operation is going and what kind of focus you're looking to into the future. And lucky for you, that's the next session. So on September 20th, Patty Durand is actually going to be talking about common goals and finding that next common path for your farm operation. So please join us on September 20th to have a conversation about common goals and that next, that next planning strategy. So that does it for our time today. Thank you very much for joining us. You will receive a link to the recording in a few days and pl please take some time to rewatch this and share it with some family members if that is something that would be supporting your family farm team. You will also be receiving an email that will um, have an event evaluation form and if you haven't filled out the registration form for the rest of the events, please do so at that time. It will be included. 
We encourage you to attend all of um, these events with our business advisors and other experts to help you walk down this farm transition path step by step. And don't worry if you miss a session, they will all be recorded and they will actually be on our FCC YouTube channel for you to rewatch if you so choose. Remember, everyone who attends the entire series will also receive a certificate in recognition of your journey through this pathway down transition planning. On behalf of everyone at FCC, thank you for joining today.